Okay, you ready for this? Yeah, it's time. It, it's time to get started. We did the perfunctory sort of introductory material for chapter one, but now we got to dive into the material. We got to dive into this class. And the way we're going to do that, I, I warned you, I warned you up front that uh, the first third of this class is going to feel very different than any of your other biology classes. The, the style of lecture, the type of content that we're going to be learning here uh, may feel kind of foreign to you, but I think it's important with this topic and, and your author does too, who, who wrote your textbook, that you need to understand the origin of ideas. We need to think about some ancient philosophies. We need to think about how uh, thought has progressed over the last thousand years with respect to how we interact and understand the natural world around us. And to do that, we really need to look at individuals in history and ask about their contributions. And we need to think about the circumstances, right? The cultural context they were in and why they had the thoughts that they had. And it's only by looking at those things that we're going to be able to get to the point where we can kind of understand the middle 1800s and the types of questions people had at that time. So chapter two is from natural philosophy to Darwin. And we're going to start in today's lecture with the discovery of deep time. Yeah, we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about geology, a little philosophy, a tinge of theology, a nice little mix today as we lay the groundwork for our current understanding of the natural world. Oh, and just before we begin, let me make a, a quick comment about my cover slide here, because you've seen it on the course website. And the reason I use that as sort of the cover image for the class is because to me, it captures the feeling of sort of the, 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 um, the history of ideas the intertwining of ideas. And we're going to see that with some of the people that we're going to mention today and their ideas and how those ideas come together to form the, the background or the, the, uh, the philosophical context that allows new ideas to form. And I also, I also think it conjures up the idea of change, all right, and, and time flowing, all right? As time flows, you have this constant change occurring. Uh, in this braided river system. So let's start all this out with uh, a little bit of a personal story. So what you're looking at right here is my backyard. This is my backyard growing up. I grew up in Western Colorado, about 28 miles from the Utah border. And this was at the end of my street. Get home from school, grab the bike, get together with my friends, go out here. This is just a couple hundred yards from my home. I'm living in a regular neighborhood, so right, right behind me, there's actually a bunch of houses, but this is literally the edge of town. And I go to the edge of town and just explore and make trouble and all kinds of things that kids do. Um, that fence wasn't there when I lived there. I took this picture a few years ago when I took my, my own kids there to show them the, one of the, the house that I grew up in. And then I took them to show my playground. So what does this have to do with this class? Well, there's something special about this particular piece of land. It is littered with fossils. Literally billions of fossils are present in these, in these sediments here. Uh, probably billions of fossils actually just laying on the surface of this land. And those fossils have something in common. They're all marine fossils which is kind of a disappointment to me because, you know, if you're a kid, you know, you're in like sixth grade and you're like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to explore this land a little bit more. I'm going to keep digging. And you know what I'm digging for. You know what I wanted to find. What does any kid want to find? All right. As a fossil, of course, I wanted to find a dinosaur. And I knew that dinosaurs were in the area. Okay. Because this is Grand Junction, Colorado. And on the other side of town, all right, out there on the, the west side of town, there is tremendous discoveries made of various like triceratops and some of the more charismatic dinosaurs. And today there's a huge museum full of dinosaur bones that were found in this particular area. Well, not this area you're looking at, but about 10 miles away. And of course I wanted to find a dinosaur. Now, I don't remember exactly if my, I, I, I've always imagined having a conversation with my dad. Don't know how real it is, but uh, you know, because it was a long time ago, but I imagine saying, Hey, I'm going to go find a dinosaur today. 
And I'm pretty sure that my dad would have said, well, you know, you can hunt all you want out there, but I don't think you're going to find any dinosaur bones. Because he knew something I didn't know. And that is, he knew that the characteristics of this particular layer of sediment, this portion of the fossil record, is all marine, right? It's all marine fossils, consistent with this being a shallow seabed. So what we're looking at here is an ancient Jurassic uh, seabed, about 180 million years old. All right, so my backyard's 180 million years old. And these are the types of organisms that were found there. There's this gastropod, that's the primary fossil that's found here. There's some ammonites, there's some shark's teeth, and a bunch of crinoids. There are modern members of crinoids alive today, by the way, but those other things are all extinct uh, organisms. And these are just littering the landscape here. And so I'm looking at uh, an ocean, right? But this is in Colorado. Now, if, you, if you're curious at all, you should ask yourself, like, why are there marine fossils in Colorado? When like 10 miles away, there's dinosaurs, right? Which aren't marine organisms. What's up with that? And surely once you recognize what a, what a fossil is, anyone hundreds of years ago should be asking themselves those questions too. How did those fossils get there? Yeah, this is what it looks like when you look at the ground. I took this picture, all right, with my kids and I, I said, look down on the ground. They looked down, I pointed the camera down here and I took this picture. Right? Look at all these gastropods here. These are all fossils, little pieces of fossils, almost some whole ones, really nice uh, specimens there. Right, And this is as, as far as you can see there, you know, out there in this shaly rock that's all decay. And then out of, the, out of that uh, eroding material are these hardened fossils. And so they're just building up on the surface. So incredible numbers of fossils, but no dinosaurs no matter how much I tried to find a dinosaur there. So any theory of the history of the Earth has to account for the presence of these, this particular set of fossils found in this particular location. And wonder mm -hmm. at what point in time in history, how long ago did these organisms live in this place? Or did they live in this place? How did they come to be here? And just to think about those dinosaurs for a moment. On the other side of town, there's layers of rock that contain lots of dinosaur bones. But there's another interesting characteristic about those particular uh, fossils, all right, that particular region. And that is there's other fossils found with those dinosaurs. And those would be cycads and a variety of different kinds of um, plants, vascular plants, almost all extinct today. Uh, we have some living relatives of those, but not the actual plants that, that existed at that time. And so it's a bunch of land vegetation, right? Organisms that live on the land, all part of a community of things that are preserved in those rocks. And those rocks are at a somewhat higher elevation in a different kind of rock compared to the rocks that I'm looking at, which are marine. And so right here, just like where I'm standing in this location in my backyard, and then thinking about the other side of town up the other side of this, this mountain over there, there's a completely different kind and a completely different set of organisms over there. That raises really interesting questions about how those things, how was there a marine environment, but then there's also an environment that's a terrestrial environment so close by. How can that be? How does that all work? These are questions that uh, have taken hundreds of years of people's observations and thinking about to develop ideas for explaining and developing um, hypotheses about the origins of fossils and the history of the earth. To explain observations or facts, right? These are facts. This is like that. This, the fact is, these fossils are right here at this particular moment in time. And I'm trying to come up with an explanation for how they came to be here. So that's what we're going to do. We have to now move back in time and we're going to follow the, we're going to trace some lines of thought to see how we came to the position we are today in terms of the different types of hypotheses that are being proposed today to explain the presence of these fossils and the context of those fossils. It's not just the, the fact of the individual fossil. It is 
what they're found with and where they're found in the fossil record that we need to find an explanation for. So we got to put some really big context on this uh, historical timeline. Your chapter is going to introduce you to a whole bunch of people, right? Each of which made some contribution to the development of thought. Uh, and we're not going to cover every single one of those. I've picked out some major um, characters, and uh, I've also listed those on your study guide in terms of the people I want you to know, and I want you to know what their major contribution is. But to sort of put a framework on it to give you an idea, a sense of like where we are in time, because I know how hard it is to just throw out numbers and years and so forth. Um, I want to show you some of the most important characters on this on this timeline. So I call this the history of ideas timeline. Now, eventually, we're going to go back to the Greeks and Romans briefly uh, with some ideas. But to start out uh, in this chapter, we're really going to start at the scientific revolution. Um, and specifically the Copernican revolution. So you have, you got Copernicus publishing a paper about uh, questioning about the, the situation of where the earth is found in the solar system, right? And that creates a whole bunch of um, issues and lots of cogitation and people thinking about that and controversy, right? All the way up into the Galileo incident and so forth. That's percolating over a hundred years. I know to us that's that's a mind-boggling length of time because you think about how much has happened in the last 20 or 30 years in the 20 and 21st century. Um, but these, these ideas take a long time uh, to sort of percolate and move through society and cause change. Um, and so you have the Copernican Revolution, and then that combined with uh, Isaac Newton eventually and his publication of Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica uh, sort of is the point at which we kind of say, like, that's the end of the scientific revolution there in 1687. All right, so about a 150-year period, which is sort of the development of what we call, like, sort of the modern scientific tools or the modern scientific methodology uh, applied to asking and answering questions about the natural world. And then since that point, we've just been sort of using the same principles, all right, since then to discover a lot of new things, but not in a fundamentally new or different way. Um, and so it's this Copernican revolution that's that first sort of, you know, break with um, sort of a traditional view of the history of the world and how to interpret the history of the world. So you have all that stuff with the Earth and its position in the solar system. Once that gives way and you have the scientific revolution sort of wrapping up in Newton, then you've got people going out there that are looking and exploring the world and sort of with new eyes. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we look at a couple uh, of the people that are important in this period. And that's when we start first getting the inkling that there is this idea that the Earth might actually be a lot older than what people think. It might be older than six or 10,000 years. Um, and that starts out very gradually. And there's a few important people that have those first thoughts. And then eventually that begins to catch on. Once that discovery of deep time and the establishment of a consensus view of deep time occurs, then you have to grapple with the implications of this deep time. And eventually that leads to deep time leads to the observation of there are different organisms in the fossil record in different layers, which suggests that over deep time, organisms have experienced some kind of change. And that's where we get the idea of adapting life and changing life, which then spurs another sort of revolution in the sense of now we have to come up with some explanation for our observations of that particular change. And that's the background. That's the, that's the context in which Charles Darwin comes into focus in the middle 1800s. So we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years, right, um, for this uh, development of ideas. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, mostly John Ray, Little Woodward, Carl Linnaeus, father of taxonomy, um, Darwin, of course, later. We're not gonna get to that in this lecture. So let's get started. Now, I have to start. I, I gotta start with John Ray. Um, we're not, we're not gonna talk about Kepler and Galileo. That's kind of well-trod territory. And we don't really need to because um, they kind of pave a way for the ability to even begin to think about uh, deep time. Um, but we need to just start where sort of the first thoughts of deep time happened. So John Ray is uh, considered one of the greatest 
um, Western European natural theologians. Now, a natural theologian, I guess I should explain, um, a natural theologian would be somebody that is trying to understand God, right, the creator, um, through the perspective of looking at the creation, right, looking at the world around us, looking at the things, the, the physical things of the world, as opposed to a theologian, all right, working in like a, a seminary or something like that, who's looking at some kind of scripture, some kind of word, some kind of, some kind of, uh, uh, information passed down, all right, in written or oral language to understand the creator. Uh, and so John Ray is looking at um, the natural world with the perspective of trying to understand the creator of that natural world. And so he's called a natural theologian or some, sometimes in some of these um, characters or people are called natural historians uh, at the time. They're looking at the history of the natural world. Um, John Ray's wrote many, many, many books, he wrote many, many different letters in communication with other renowned, other, I can't really call them scientists at the time because they're, that word doesn't really exist in, in that particular uh, context, but I mean, essentially other scientists. Uh, he so he wrote this book, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation, a big tome in which he describes all kinds of things about the world around us. And he made major contributions to our current understanding of the world. So here we have uh, just some of the things that, uh, that he's known for. He is sometimes given credit for writing the first dictionary, just observing what people's, you know, taking words that he heard and writing down definitions of those words and keeping track of those, uh, keeping a log of them. He established the methods of classification we use today. Now, not the Carl Linnaeus uh, specific epithet binomial naming system, right? The Latin binomial naming system, but the basic ideas of how organisms could be classified by looking at um, their overall features and looking for similar characteristics between different groups and then creating nested hierarchies. You've got you have um, individuals that represent a species and you have, uh, you might have one species that's very similar to another, or like three species that are similar to each other. You kind of put them, you lump them together in a group because they share a bunch of characteristics. And then those are like in a larger group of organisms. Now, Lalaeus gets all like a, a whole bunch of credit for the whole taxonomy thing, right? How we classify uh, and in terms of establishing formal ranks and, and how we actually name things. Um, but John Ray is, is, is really describing uh, a, a method that is a very kind of what we call a natural method of organization because it's intuitive and it looks at um, the holistic portions of the organ, like multiple characters of an organism to try to understand how they're similar to one another. Now, I'm, I'm being very careful with my words here. Um, he wouldn't say how they're related to one another, like in the word related, meaning they have a common ancestor with one another. So later in the 1800s, that's where that, those two things get pieced together. You have, you have groups of things that are similar. Well, maybe they're similar because they share a common ancestor that then gave those descendants those particular characteristics. Um, he provides us with the first simple definition of a species, right? He was a great observer of nature, of rocks, fossils, plants, and animals. And as he observed plants and animals, he observed the characteristics of multiple individuals and populations and derived a definition for what he considered to be a species, which is a, a group of individuals with similar characteristics that don't frequently or ever mate with another group of individuals, right? That's very much what we call the biological species concept today. And here's the big one, all right? Here's the, here's the important one. He spent a lot of time reflecting on the age of the earth. And I got a, I didn't point out before, this is 1627, 1705. So late 1600s, right? Late 17th century. Um, he's already thinking about, hmm, this earth might be older than we've been led to believe or that we commonly believe at the time, which then led him to think about a historical global flood 
And in particular, he thought a lot about fossils. Now, when I say he thought, thought a lot about fossils, most people of his day, there's only a few hundred of the individuals who have ever really suggested that those things that you and I call fossils, that you and I just intuitively like, oh, a fossil is something that was alive in the past and now it's been preserved in some way and turned into stone or turned into agite or turned into or permineralized. I mean, there's various ways that things get preserved and changed over time, but hey, right, th they were something that was actually alive in the past. Now, this is a little mind numbing, but there, if you had lived in the mid 17th century, it is highly unlikely that you would look at this rock right here. You know, if you're hiking around rock split open and you saw what I'm showing you here in this screen, you wouldn't immediately say, oh, that's a former fern. That was a, something that was a fern a long time ago and it's been preserved in this rock. Like those are the remnants of an actual fern that was actually alive sometime in the past. I don't know when, but sometime in the past that, that fern was alive you wouldn't have had that thought as quickly as you think it now it's hard to put yourself in their shoes but you wouldn't have thought that even if there are other organisms that are alive today maybe even just like i look over there to the side and there's some ferns and i see that there's a very uh there's a, they're very comparable right you know a lot of features in this rock that are very similar to this living fern but nonetheless you wouldn't have made that connection between the two you would have had all kinds of other hypotheses for what these rocks are doing. Um, there's various crystals, there's various types of things that grow in sort of fractal patterns as they, as they like salts, um, that can take on forms that kind of look like some living things. And so they were generally thought to be inorganic, non-living. Of course, the material there is non-living, but it's always been non-living and they're uh, one of the names was sports of nature, things that take on the form that look like things that are alive through some other mechanism. And often is just described as God has made, you know, the creator who made these rocks just made things in the rocks to magnify the glory of the organisms and living things that are living on top of the rocks. Right. Sort of like a uh, like an homage to the living things that are out there. I mean, all of these ideas are very, very foreign to you uh, in terms of like how you how you could think that way. But you wouldn't have thought that this was an actual living thing, except that John Ray and a few others um, looked at these things and really, really thought about them and investigated them in a much closer way, uh, more detailed way. And as they started doing that and looking at living things, the connections were so close that they got this idea that, wow, maybe this thing was alive and somehow it's been preserved in the rock. You know, maybe this rock formed from some material that wasn't solid before and this fern got trapped in there and these are the remnants of that fern. So to make this a, a you know a, a, another like actually specific example, something that John Ray actually actually talks about is um, these mussels, right? You can observe he could observe on the English shore that there was all these mussels along the shore growing on the rocks, but then there were also up in the hills, all right, in areas close to the sea, but clearly above the sea, right? There were these rocks that had these formations in them and they look a lot like mussels but the likeness goes beyond just like they look like them they also have a community sort of uh presence about them and what i mean by that is if you have a if you have a group of of these mussels on shore what you'll find is that there's going to be some that are opened up because they're dead all right and when they die they open up and the internal living material decays um, and then you have living ones that hold their shells shut. And then you also have much, you have different growth stages, right? You have young ones and you have older ones. You have little tiny baby ones, right? All in that same community. And that's what John Ray observed in the rocks. He observed that, you know what? There's these different stages. 
So how can the rocks like make themselves look like a community of organisms? This looks like it was just preserved as a community of mussels. And so is this and a whole bunch of other examples that just got his got him scratching his head. But here's the point. And I know I've spent a lot of time on this, but here's the point of all this. Once you have this idea, once the once the idea enters your head that these might actually be things that had been living in the past, then you have to ask yourself the next question which nobody before had to ask themselves. And that is when did they live? It's like, when, like when, when were they alive? And how did they get up on the mountains, right? Because they're not in the sea anymore. So how did these rocks get up high above the ocean? And when did these organisms live? And those were, that was a head scratcher. You know, I've read some of John Ray's letters and he doesn't really fully, he can't really fully understand that. Well, because he doesn't understand many of the basic principles you understand about geology today. Um, and so he didn't have an explanatory framework for that other than there is one possible explanatory framework that was available to people at this particular time in the mid 17th century. And that is, there was this global flood, right? Scriptures, um, the, the Hebrew Bible, talks about a global flood, the Noahic flood. And maybe this flood was something because it covered the whole world. Maybe there were organisms alive before the world. Well, there were organisms alive before the world. And after when this flood happened, they all got covered up with sediments very, very quickly. And that could have preserved lots of living things. And then somehow this stuff became rocks. You'd also have to have it lifted up or or at least the oceans coming down or something like that in order to leave the, the, the fossils where they are. So John Ray struggled with this like for much of his life and really never had full resolution. But that's what I appreciate about John Ray is that, um, you know, he is faced with something that is shaking his paradigm, right? His paradigm is he lives in a world in which everyone's working under the assumption that the world is very young. Um, and there's a flood, but, but even so nobody was really talking about a flood at the time. They're not talking about how the flood made different kinds of rocks or made the fossils or anything like that, because no one was really thinking about those things. Everyone just assumed that the mountains they saw and valleys and all these things were just, that's the way the world was made. Right. But then once you have fossils being formerly living things, you can't just say they were made that way because then you would have to say that the creator who made everything just put everything into the rocks as they are. So all these things that look like they were living actually never were living before. They were just created that way. So this is causing all kinds of interesting thoughts in people's minds and they're going back and forth and arguing with each other. John Ray talks about John Woodward, uh, references him and they, have some pretty lively discussions. We'll say arguments with each other. All right. Good thing they didn't have social media back then. All right. You have to write letters, which makes you spend a little time thinking about what you want to say uh, and how you say it. Um, nonetheless, some of them are pretty testy. <laughs> so let's move to John Woodward. All right. And, and John Woodward, 1665 to 728. So he's overlapping with John Ray, lives a little bit longer. John Woodward was a flamboyant um, popularizer of ideas. Not necessarily very well trained, but he certainly had a way of communicating with the average person. And that, just like today, right? There's influencers. He's an influencer. And, and um, what he said and the way he said it drew a lot of the common people to things, right? Um, and so what he did was he was he did what a lot of them, I mean, there's a bunch of other people who got kind of excited at this very initial stage of trying to understand um, where the physical features of the earth came from. And there was this new idea that maybe a global flood might have shaped the earth in some way. Whereas before it was like, oh, the flood just sort of covered the world and then just the water ran off. But now it's like, well, maybe the flood did something more than that in terms of shaping the world because maybe it's the cause of fossils. And since fossils are now being found in lots and lots of different layers, that means the world has been greatly changed over time versus being more static. So John Woodward writes 
uh, a book or I mean an essay, but it's basically a, a, a long essay toward the natural history of the earth. Sort of like a like I'm going to try to explain all the physical surroundings around you and the fossils that you see uh, in 1695. So he he agreed he was influenced by John Ray and that was like yes these things were living things. I, you, you convinced me like this that's a really powerful argument when you show me these communities of organisms preserved in the fossil record. Um, and so he got this idea. He got this brilliant idea and, and expressed it in this particular book. And I'm not sure he had the, he's the first person to have this idea, but as I said before, he's an influencer, right? He, he's somebody who connects with people, knows how to distribute, write essays, pamphlets, and get them out there. Uh, and, as a, and because of that, um, he is able to promote this idea that the flood then this global flood dissolved all the rocks. So the world cracks open, water flows out, it dissolves the upper surface of the crust of the earth. And as it does so, well, all the organisms that are living on the earth all get jumbled up into that, all right? One, as he called it, one common confused mass of stuff, of sediment and living things. Well, they're now dead things. And then as the waters began to settle, right? Then the sediments settle. And as the sediments settle, they settle along with the remains of all the dead organisms. And then they get, in his mind, they kind of sort out, right? Lighter things are at the top and heavier things at the bottom. So, um, and then that gives you some sort of uh, layering and it gives you some sort of order of fossils uh, in, these, in these different layers. And this would have been kind of crudely based on some observations. It's not like there'd been lots of studies on, in, uh, on specific sequences of rocks and people have, you know, outlined every single fossil found different layers. There were sort of like smatterings of like, oh, there's, you can find this over here and this over here. And I found this over here, um, but enough to kind of have this creative idea that this could be an explanation for that. Um, and as a result, um, he's really the father of what today is called in, in modern, sort of the modern explanation, the modern takeoff on this idea is called young earth creation, all right, or young earth creationism. Another name for it is, and for his idea is flood geology, that the world's rocks are the result of a giant flood and that most of the topological features of the surface of the earth are the result of a global flood. Um, another name for it is deluge geology, or um, um, sometimes called scriptural geologists, uh, later on in the 17th, or well, actually 19th century. All right, so Woodward, keep that in mind, because that is a kind of a competing model for the history of the earth, but it is a creative and a reasonable sounding argument at the time, because this comes into the context of, well, I mean, we're being Eurocentric here in this talk, obviously. Um, but if we're talking about Western Europe, um, the predominant ideas of Western Europe come from, about the history of the Europe, would have come from the Hebrew scriptures at the time. And therefore, uh, this fit right in with that, right? So this is widely uh, accepted or at least uh, thought of as like a plausible idea. All right. Now, we got to shift gears a little bit. Okay, so now let's, I mean, we haven't really discussed like the age of the earth, this deep time idea. Now, obviously with Ray and with Woodward, what, what you end up with is if you have to explain fossils, well, that fossils had to occur sometime in the past, but Woodward managed to find a past that wasn't that far in the past, right? If, if all of it was one, all fossils were sort of basically created all at one time, Maybe they could all have been created during the flood. And since the flood is only four or 5,000 years ago by a very strict chron chronological reading uh, of, of the Hebrew scriptures, then that's not that long ago. So that doesn't really stretch the idea that the earth is more than six or 10,000 years old. Now, John Ray had an inkling that it might be much, much older. Now, he never wanted to commit to that. For one thing, it was kind of a heretical thing to say. And so it's hard to say that he, he had he hinted at that in, in various letters, that when he thinks about 
how would you form all these different sediments and how would you make mountains and lift these things up and all this that he imagined that must take an awful lot of long time but he didn't really have any tools to be able to like you know specify how much time uh, to measure that particular time or estimate that time so let's move forward a little bit in time all right we got james hutton all right james hutton 1726 1797 so now we're in the 18th century um, so a little bit after Ray, and he's known as the father of geology, right? What things that he discovered and did and said and wrote down make up many of the fundamental principles of geology. Uh, and so he, and he's famous for the phrase, the present is the key to the past. The present is the key to the past. Present processes, how erosion happens. Uh, how earthquakes occur and volcanoes and, and uh, what rivers do and so forth. Those things are things that have always happened in the past because of the consistency of nature, that the, the basic natural laws, and this, of course, would go with Newton too as, as well at the time, right? 1686 for Newton. Um, so Newton has kind of established that there are these physical laws in, in physics that are undergirding all of nature. Um, in terms of how objects move and interact with one another. So taking that idea and saying, like, if we can learn how something happens today and we can make estimates of rates of things today, those are probably the similar rates to what's happening in the past for things. And we can do extrapolations from the past, from, I'm sorry, from the present to the past. So he has a very creative idea, all right? This is a very clever thing he did. Um, he said... In order to get an estimate of erosion, how fast does something erode? Right? We could see that, you know, entropy, things are falling apart. Uh, that objects uh, like, well, like great art, all right, statues from the Greeks and Romans uh, don't look as pristine as they once did when they were first made, right? They're being subjected to various forms of erosion. And he said, how would we know, how could we figure out what that erosion rate is? So one thing he did was he went to Hadrian's Wall. I remember Hadrian's Wall, 80, 122 to 128, took a long time to build this wall. This is a wall that goes all the way across a northern part of Great Britain, you know, to keep the marauders out from the north. Um, now, it didn't really, wasn't terribly effective. Um, I mean, who would think that a, a, a wall could effectively like keep people out who really wanted to get in. But uh, he, t he knew, though, that Hadrian's Wall was built during a certain period of time. You know, at, at most, it was AD 122 in terms of its age. And so here you're just seeing a little section of, of Hadrian's Wall, and it clearly doesn't look like it used to, but you could get an idea of what it would have looked like. You could figure out the sort of the dimensions of like, you know, when it was flat off the, on the top and so forth. And you could see like, how much material is gone and so now you had like here's the date of origin you knew the origin point and you knew how far away you were from that origin point so you have a number of years so over that span of years this is how much erosion has taken place now you might be thinking well people took rocks off that wall and built other things with it and so forth how could he know that he was no dummy he knew that that was a possible variable um, he went to parts of the wall that were probably less influenced uh, by those types of activities. And he looked at areas where it's just the rocks have decayed from, you know, freezing and thawing and raining and snowing and lichens and other organisms, mosses growing on them that excrete acid and they're, so they're breaking it down, right? So these rocks are literally eroding away very slowly over time. But how slowly? You take that measurement of how much material had disappeared, you know, how many inches of rock is missing divide it by the number of total years you have and you have a rate you have a like a, an approximate average per year of how much rock can be eroded just by natural forces um, and then he said hey i've got a basic rate now what we can do is we could apply this to an unknown and un uh, something that we don't know the age of hadrian's wall we knew the age of we don't know what the age of arthur's seat volcano is up in the Edinburgh Scarlet. Now we recognize, you know, they they you know, 
1700s now, there's enough basic sort of geological knowledge to recognize different types of rocks, right? You have your metamorphic rock and you have your sedimentary rock and forth. This is, this is volcanic basalt. And we knew, they knew that basalt is made by volcanoes, all right? This is molten rock that comes up from the earth and spreads itself on top of the surface. And so therefore, at one point, this was just molten rock that solidified. So that's its origin point when it solidified, when, when, this rock, when this rock was formed. And so he said, this is some kind of old volcano, all right? And this old volcano, which is a, a mountain in Scotland, uh, he kind of estimated what the original side would have been, like how, what would have the flanks have been on a typical volcano that is brand new, like active, because clearly this is not an active volcano. You can see this is an extinct volcano. It's been eroding clearly has eroded a whole bunch. So you got a general profile of what this thing would have looked like. And you can figure like how much mass has been eroded away of basalt. And he took those numbers, which were very similar to the type of rock that's found on, on some of Hadrian's wall. And he took the estimate for Hadrian's wall, applied it to Arthur C. Volcano. And, you know, not surprisingly, he got a really big number for the age of the volcano. Yeah, it's hundreds of thousands of years old. So this was quite shocking. Like, yeah, that's it, it takes a long time to wear rock down uh, by just the general usual forces that are occurring. So this is like, okay, mm, man, it's not 10,000 years and not 100,000 years. It would be hundreds of thousands of years old, potentially, just to just this particular location. So just to round off this brief discussion of the discovery of deep time. Let's just take one other example. All right, so here I am in one of my, in my younger years when I'm uh, skinnier and I uh, have a darker beard. All right, and I'm pointing at Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And of course, I'm, I'm taking a photo from a perspective, right? I'm actually many miles away from it. Um, and to give you an idea of how large uh, Devil's Tower is, um, here is that that arrow there is pointing at a hike of, well, at a climber, right? That's on the side of that thing about halfway up, all right? It's about 850 feet high. So this is a huge monolith, all right? Uh, this is the neck of, you can think of it as the neck of a volcano, but really it's a the neck of a, a dike, right? And a dike is when you have layers of rock, or you have, you know, the ground and there's a crack in it and molten magma moves up through that crack. And then when it's probably pushing it, uh, you know, wedging it open too, and then it solidifies in that crack, right? And then, then you have this left when everything else erodes. That's the basic picture of what's happening here. But let me, let me give you a better idea here. So Nicholas Steno, who we're going to talk about more in the next lecture, Right, because we got a couple lectures to go to get kind of get through these these concepts. Um, Nicholas Steno, who's the father of stratigraphy, um, he would have loved this site, thinking about this site, although he never was in this particular location, um, because it represents a set a historical series of events, and because it represents a long series of events, it represents the unfolding of the history of the earth as a series of discrete historical events, each of which probably takes a long period of time. So now let me explain this. Um, how would you get this, this big blob of solidified magma, just this giant chunk of basalt? That's 100% basalt. But the area around here I mean, there's some basalt chunks because they've broken off of this thing, but laying on the surface. But the ground here, out here, and then what you can't see off to the side is there's like a higher area over there as well. It's sort of a red sandstone, right? Completely different kind of rock. It's, it's a sedimentary rock. And so this, this thing is surrounded by sedimentary rock. And then you just got this blob of basalt, right? We need some kind of explanation, right? Where did it come from? What's the origin of this? 
And so here's the here's the general explanation. There's actually a couple hypotheses, um, and some you know, there's not enough evidence to divide between you know the two primary hypotheses yet. But what we do know is almost certainly in the past, if you had been there at this location, you would have been more than 850 feet higher than you are now when we hiked around, when I took my family there and we hiked around Devil's Tower, right? We would have been 850 feet higher because this entire area, right, of hundreds of square miles in here was all full of sediments, all full of sedimentary rock. And we know that because you can look off to the, off in the distance and there is a higher plateau, right? of sedimentary rock that if you go from one side, oh, I got to put my hands in here. If you go from one side all the way over to the, one side, all the way over to the other side, right? Off the distance one way, off the distance another, and you trace the line across, you'd see like, oh, those layers over there match up with the layers over there. And they're as high as the top of this tower. So it looks like this whole area was covered with thick layers of sedimentary rock. And then most of this rock got eroded. But when it eroded, sedimentary rock erodes more quickly. I mean, that's the present is the key to the past and the whole idea of processes occurring in the same fashion today as they did in the past. Sedimentary rock, is not as uh, bonded together as strongly as basalts are. And therefore water is gonna erode it more quickly than it would the basalts. And that's true today. And that should be true hundred years ago. It should be true 10,000 years ago. It should be true 10 million years ago. And so what you have is you have the land was this high. And so the proposal is this, is that when the land was all 850 feet higher or possibly even a little bit more, that there was an intrusion of magma from deep down. Now, Yellowstone's not real far away, and there's lots of other areas where there's volcanoes in Wyoming and so forth. So it's not uncommon that we know that there's been pools of magma underneath the ground here in these locations. And so that magma comes up, pushes its way through, cracks open the earth, melts its way through that sedimentary rock all the way up because this whole land is much higher before. And then I'm indicating that maybe it spilled out on top and then covered the surface for some potential area. Now that's what we can't really know because you know what? All that's eroded. It's all gone, right? And so since that's all gone, we don't know if it actually covered up the sedimentary rock, but it could have also not made it to the surface. There are many times, um, this just happened in Iceland recently. Um, well, there's been several uh, actual uh, releases of magma onto the surface, but there's also been a bunch of earthquakes and we know that magma is moving around and has been pushing its way through various cracks. And then it looks like it's gonna come out and then nothing happens. And basically it solidifies, right? It, it got too cold, right? Before it got to the surface, it solidified and then it couldn't go any farther. So that's what could happen here too. It could have been this big dike of magma has moved up, gotten almost to the surface and then stopped, you know, and it actually has a very flat top on this thing. So it could be, there was a somewhat harder layer of sandstone. It kind of like got up to that point uh, and then kind of moved, you know, and then just couldn't push through that next layer. Right. And so then it just was a hard, you know, a hard lump of, ma of basalt that was buried. And so if you had stood here at some point in the past, tens of millions of years ago, maybe, um, you would have just seen a flat surface, like maybe a high plain here. And then eventually rivers eroded all this land and what eroded out of the land was, you know, over time you just have erosion, you know, roads farther, roads more, and it's still eroding today, right? This whole area is eroding off into the river that's below right in front here. And so it's getting, you know, the, the land around is getting lower all the time, whereas the actual um, pedestal on top is probably, you know, it's eroding at an extremely slow rate because of how hard that basalt is. And so it's gonna be around for a long time. 
And 100,000 years from now, this area will look quite different. It's going to have an even taller, you know, spire sitting there. Devil's Tower will be more impressive, probably. Okay, what's the, I mean, you know, I spent a long time on this. This was a long time to talk about one example. But the point here is that Steno and others from the late 1700s and into the 1800s started to realize that it's, um, you know, the geological formations of the earth are complex, right? You have, you have like 5,000 feet of rock below this, like a mile of layers of sediment below here. And that magma has moved all the way up through that. Then you had another 850 feet. Well, all those layers of sediment had to been come from somewhere, right? You know, there were other mountains. There was, you know, it's, that eroded and then filled up this entire area over a, what must be a very long period of time. The alternative explanation was Woodward's, which is maybe it all got covered. Maybe all these layers of sediment were laid down like really quick in a global flood all at one time. But the layers of sediment are are like, you know, you get a strip of red sandstone and then you have layers of shale. Then you have layers, you have layers of different kinds of rocks representing different kinds of environments that have different temperatures and different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of organic matter in them. That suggests that the different layers were laid down when there was different kinds of plants present than other times. When there was more water or less water that was desert times and there was times that were uh, much damper um and so then you have that stack that all up and then so here's the thing you have to stack all that up but all of that has to be present before the magma comes up through right then once all the magma comes up through then you have all that erosion and so what you it, it's just a bunch of different events which is hard to say all could have happened at one time. And that's the idea of, of, um, the, uh, of Steno's sort of stratigraphy is that there is a series of events. You, know, you have cracks in rocks and then you have dikes and you have, you have erosion. And then maybe you could even have erosion and you can have new, new sediment placed on top of where that was eroded. And we see that in many places in the world as well. So all these things lead to this growing perception that it takes a long time to make some of these features of the earth and they're not easily explained away by very fast events um, because the the types of processes can't work that fast to make these types of objects so then you're left with some stark choices it's sort of like well maybe devil's tower was just made exactly the way it looks God made it, you know, just uh, you know, our creator made that, uh, made it just the way it looks today or very similar to the way it looks today. But Woodward and others, especially anyone in the 1800s, had kind of abandoned the idea, had really abandoned the idea that, um, that, that a, any kind of creator, any God that's making the universe and the earth would have made it to look the way it does today. And the reason is because of fossils. See, fossils are the absolute, this is why we spent some time talking about fossils and just talking about the change in attitude, the, 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 the discovery that fossils are formerly living things. Because before that, you didn't need to explain, and the earth could just be made the way it looks and the fossils could be made along with that earth. But now what almost everybody's convinced of in the 1800s is, those fossils represent things that were alive in the past. And guess what? There's really no fossils inside this basalt, but there's a whole bunch of fossils inside the sedimentary rock that's surrounding it. So in the layers of rock that are around this basalt, there's lots of fossils, which means the layers of rock must have been laid down after those organisms lived, right? Or at least during the time that they lived. And so, if they had just, if God had just made these layers of rock with the fossils in them, that meant those organisms were never alive in the past. And that's not a hypothesis that many people have been wanting to consider for the last 200 years. All right, so all we've done so far, all we've done so far is built up a, a I've, I've, I've given you just the, the briefest sort of window into the mindset of people from the 1600s and 1700s 
who are discovering that the world is really complex and that because of fossils and uh, the discovery that there are layers of different kinds of rocks that make up and compose the geological features of the earth, all these things are leading people to think that the world may be much, much older than they previously thought. Now we'll have to talk about the fossils and the fossil order, and then what people had to start thinking about then when they noticed that. So that's part two, right? We're gonna actually going to go back and we're going to look at a, an idea from much farther in the past, 2,000 years ago, of the great chain of being, because we need to set up sort of that, that philosophical foundation uh, for how those ideas of the Greeks and Romans and so forth uh, have been co-opted by people in the 1800s. Um, we'll talk about Carl Linnaeus, Nicholas Steno a little bit more, Buffon, William Paley, the, the, which is a design argument, uh, Mary Anning and her discovery of extinction, that organisms go extinct. I mean, that's, that's a totally foreign concept to Steno and to uh, John Ray, all right? They thought that fossils represent former living things, but they assumed that everything that they saw as a fossil was still alive today on Earth. They had, they had no concept that uh, an organism might actually not still actually exist. Um, and then we'll get real close to talking about Darwin when we talk about Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. But we'll save Darwin and his contemporaries for the third lecture. Okay, I'll see you for part two. Make sure you've been taking notes. Remember, we got that Q&A time. You can ask me anything about whatever I've said in this past lecture, anything that piqued your curiosity. Uh, because I know that I am just brushing the surface of many of these ideas. Uh, we're just trying to get a general sense for the flow of history and the flow of ideas so that we have some idea of like where these ideas came up, came up from uh, in the 1800s. They didn't just appear out of nowhere. All right, that's enough. Got to finish for the day. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.